Okay, so we're going to be talking about rockers. Um, this slide is all about me. And the only thing of interest in here is that um, I teach a master's in data science at Dundee, which is designed for people to do part time people just like yourselves. So this is this. These talks at Elbag have proved an interesting recruiting ground for that course. Most of you won't be interested. All I will say is just drop me an, e an email if you're interested in it. OK, we have a plan. This was the description I put up of this talk. A wonderful journey will take us. Well, actually, what we're going to talk about is listed there. True and false positives, true and false negatives, confusion matrix, rock space and rock curves. I actually have an explanation as to why they're called rock or why this is called rock space receiver operator characteristics. I've left that to the end because it's not essential to an understanding of them. It's fascinating about why they're called that. So if we have enough time for that, I'll talk about why they're called that as well. So those are the four main things I want to get over during this talk. So um, small joke there in the title binary or not. As you guys will know, I hope, a lot of machine learning problems essentially come down to binary classification. We're trying to decide, is this person honest or are they trying to commit a fraud? Does this thing pass or does it fail some test? Now, not all machine learning problems can be split into binary classification. If they can't, what we'll often do with them, and say we have four categories, we may split, essentially make them binary by saying, um, build a machine learning system that will tell you whether they're A or not A, and another one that will tell you whether they're B or not B. So we can often split things down into binary classifications. We don't have to, but it's frequently done. In this case, the main thing I'm going to talk about here is a problem which has been occupying me for a while, um, and it's to do with identifying tractors and not tractors. And the only interest we have in this is um, there are some cameras set up on some roads. They're taking pictures as vehicles pass. And we, what we want to know is, are they tractors or not tractors? We're not interested in, in them if they're not tractors. So it's a nice example of a binary system. This, incidentally, if it sounds like a bizarre thing to do, this does not mean I have a strange hobby, hobby of identifying tractors. It's to do with an anaerobic digester that was put in um, the planning permission for it was agreed because um, they were not shipping material to the anaerobic digester. They've then started shipping a large amount of material. This is contrary to the planning permission they were given. So that's I, not that this has to interest you, but there is a good reason for trying to do this. It's not an academic exercise. It's about saving the planet because it doesn't save the planet very much if you put an anaerobic digester in the middle of the countryside and then use tractors to ship stuff to it. So that's that's the background to this. OK, <clears throat> this has ended up as a game called Spot the Tractor. So up top right, you can see that is a tractor. Uh, bottom right, that is not a tractor, that is a Land Rover Defender. Bottom left, you're looking at that, probably thinking, well, that is a tractor. You've said it isn't a tractor. Well, it isn't a tractor in this particular definition because it's not shipping stuff to, the, to or from the digester. So that's something to bear in mind. When we talk about building a machine learning system where you say it's going to spot tractors or not, it doesn't have to be what you or I would think of as a tractor. It can be a very specific tractor or it can be a very specific thing that it's trying to do. Okay, and as I hope you guys are all aware, because we're not going to be talking about it this evening, um, when you try and construct a machine learning system, in this case, it was a neural net, you're trying to construct a machine learning algorithm that can look at pictures and tell you whether they're tractors or not tractors. What you have to do first, it is create a lot, well, take a large number of images, and then a human being sorts through them and says, that's a tractor, that's not a tractor, neither is that, that isn't, that is. And that person has to be able to spot this particular definition of tractor. And we end up with labeled sets, big pile of images where we know those are tractors, big pile where they're not tractors. Then we train the machine learning algorithm. 
We stuff these through one at a time and it gets the label that says, this one's a tractor. What's coming in now is a tractor, okay? Okay, this next one is not a tractor. So we're giving it the image, we're giving it the, the label and it learns. A fascinating process, which this talk is completely not about. This talk is much more <clears throat> about how we test a trained neural net. So we've trained one, we've given it a lot of images, we now think it's good enough to recognize tractors and not tractors. And this is the point where we become interested in how we evaluate that testing. How is it doing? That leads us to things like confusion matrix, rock space, ultimately rock curves. And it's all about how can we evaluate how good this model is? Because in the real world, where a lot of us live now, in the real world, you generally don't create one model and it's perfect and it does everything. You create lots of different models and you want to assess which ones are good, which ones are bad. You might combine a couple to make a better model. So we're very, very interested in this process of how can we test this um, machine learning algorithm? How can we evaluate it? How can we tell how good it is? So that's really what the whole talk is about, just this tiny bit of machine learning, the testing. Okay. So the algorithm that we build, the machine learning algorithm, it's important to realize it can be correct in two very distinct ways. You can give it a tractor and it can look at it and say, tractor, tractor, that's a tractor. Well, that's right, it was right. Brilliant, well done machine learning algorithm. You can show the GPO van or a Royal Mail van and it can look at and say, that's not a tractor. In both of those cases, the algorithm is correct, but those are distinguishable. One is identifying a tractor, the other is being certain it isn't a tractor. The algorithm can also be incorrect in two ways. It can look at that big green thing with yellow wheels, lots of noise. Well, it can't hear the noise, but big green thing, yellow wheels, and it can say, no, it's not a tractor. And you and I think, idiot, it's clearly a tractor. Well, it can be wrong like that. It can look at that Royal Mail van and say, yep, that's a tractor. Quite definitely, absolutely. Oh, God. So bear in mind, it's got two ways of being right and two ways of being wrong. So we can standardize our description of these four states. And we're gonna be using these not only throughout the rest of this discussion, but we're also going to be uh, they're also just common in the discussion of rock curves. Yes. So it is quite important that you kind of try and get your brain around these. So the reality is, let's say we, we've got reality here, and that reality is a picture of a tractor. And if the neural net says tractor, yep, definitely a tractor, then we call that a true positive. That's one of the ways it can be right. Another option, we show it a tractor and it says, no, that's not a tractor. Well, that is a false negative. Now you'll notice incidentally that I'm adopting the term positive for spotting a tractor. And you could say, well, why have you chosen tractor to be positive? And honestly, that's a purely arbitrary choice you make at the beginning. I could have reversed almost every slide in this talk if I'd said, I'm gonna regard tractors as negative and anything else as positive. So I do want you to understand that's a kind of an arbitrary choice on my part, but I've decided identifying tractors is positive. So tractor, if it says tractor and it see and the picture is a tractor, true positive. If we show it a van and it says that's not a tractor, so now that's what the neural net is saying. This is what we're showing it. If it says not tractor, well, that's a true negative. So both of these guys are positive. Of course, you can get it wrong. It can say tractor when it clearly isn't. Well, we call that a false positive because it's saying tractor. It's making the positive statement that is a tractor and it's wrong. We can show it a tractor and it can say that's not a tractor and that's a false negative. And these are fairly straightforward descriptions. I will tell you now that most people when learning this stuff find it hard to get their brain around these after a while. And I will try not to just throw them at you all the time. Well, that's true positive, that's false negative. I will try and explain them. After a while, they become more intuitive. 
OK, well, I, I'm going to try my best to explain positive and negative, <clears throat> but I, I defer here to a master of the English language. This is a Donald Trump quote I came across recently, and he said, I tested very positively in another sense. So this morning, yeah, I tested positively towards negative, right? So I tested perfectly this morning, meaning I tested negative. And I think if any of you ever lose track of what is a false positive or what is a true, uh, what is a false positive or a true negative, I think just go back to that phrase and reflect upon it and everything will become clear. Or not. Anyway, <clears throat> just to remind you, you see this this little this little bar popped up again. Why is why is it doing that? Why does it do that? It bugs me. Does it bug you guys? Do we care? Oh, I got rid of it. OK, so something else to bear in mind. Think of this diagram. I'm going to show you the diagram always, uh, always the same way. True positives. These are good. True negatives. These are good. These are bad. Good, bad, good, bad. Fairly straightforward. OK, we have trained our neural net. We are going to test it with 100 pictures of tractors and 100 pictures of not tractors. And there are exactly 100 pictures, and those are honestly all pictures of tractors. They're a bit small, I agree, but they are really 100 pictures of tractors. These are 100 pictures of not tractors. We stuff those through the neural net, and we count how many it gets right. Now, bear in mind, we're testing it at the minute, so we know which of these are tractors and which aren't. Okay. Well, suppose in this case, it gets 96 of the real tractors, it says tractor. Of the real tractors, it gets four wrong. It says they're not tractors, and they are. 100 not tractors, it says 89 of those are tractors. Uh, sorry, 89 of those are not tractors. And 11 of them, it misidentifies and says they're tractors. Now, at the moment, I'm not very interested in numbers, except to point out to you that we've reached number two in our exciting list of things to explain, because the <clears throat> this thing is a confusion matrix. And a confusion matrix says, this is the number of these I fed in, this is the number it got right, this is the number it got wrong. So this is a confusion matrix. I have no idea why it's called a confusion matrix. I mean, it's such a weird name. It's an unconfusion matrix. It makes things obvious. So they are typically laid out like this. A couple of things to notice about a confusion matrix, which will prove later use, uh, prove useful later. If you feed in 100 here, if it gets 96 of them there, it has to get four of them there because it's it's this line is dealing with those 100. So 96 of them it identified as tractors, that leaves four then it must have got wrong. So these two numbers, if you feed 100 in each of these, you'll get 100 out and these guys will always sum to 100. These numbers, these totals do not have to be the same at all. Um, those obviously sum to that, that sums to that, but these two don't have to match. If you feed in the same number in each case, they will get the same number out. So there's kind of slight asymmetry in, in how it adds across. So, OK, we've got a number of machine learning algorithms. Let's say we're, we're trying four or five machine learning algorithms. How are we going to validate them? How are we going to judge? Are we going to sit and say, well, that one's really good and that one's not too bad? No, we need a more precise measure. We are data scientists. We're not just going to say that one's brilliant. We're going to we're going to quantify it in some way. So we need a more precise measure, and you have now been introduced to the confusion matrix there. With a confusion matrix, so I've put a generalized confusion matrix up here, and I've labeled true positive, false negative, false positive, true negative. And that's the number that we feed in of the actual positive. So that was my 100 tractors, that was my 100 not tractors. And there are multiple metrics that you can make up that take some number here and divide it by another, add three, divide by four, multiply by pi. That list is totally not um, complete. You, you can get pages of these metrics that people have made up. They take this number, divide it by that number, and add three. Metrics we can use. 
the rock space and rock curves directly use two of these, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. And they are beautifully simple. The true positive rate says, how many have you got here? How many true positives did you get? I think in the, let me go back. Yeah, here I had 96 as my true positive rate. So the true positives rate says, take 96, divide it by the number you fed in, which was 100, and your true positive rate is 0 0.96. So it's that number divided by that number. The false positive rate is that number divided by that one. So a nice simple matrix. It uses another two directly, indirectly, and I'll explain why. So rock curves use these very simple matrix, which makes them extraordinarily clever because they're very, very good and very useful, and they make use of fairly straightforward matrix. So next I'm going to look at the Titanic data. You're probably all aware there's, there's data about the Titanic when it sank, who survived, who died. And that data is freely available. It's really commonly used for this. That is a neural net I built, which predicts whether people are going to survive or die. So just to put that into context, true positive, I assumed that survival was a positive thing. So a true positive, my algorithm said the passenger would survive, and they did. False positive, my, my algorithm said the passenger would survive and they didn't, and the other two are the reverses. Um, I've put that slide in more or less to help you if you're ever going through this talk. You can pause it and read it if you like. Note what I said earlier. If we feed in 100 survivors in this case, my algorithm says 83 are going to survive. You know what what goes in here next because it said 83 are going to survive it must have had must have said 17 weren't going to survive same is true down here so feed in 100 if it's 10 there it's got to be 90 there hey we've reached rock space this is rock space because rock space is simply plotting these numbers so the confusion matrix is absolutely your friend it is a vital piece of equipment we use. And rock space is simply a way of visualizing all the information in one um, confusion matrix as a single point on a two-dimensional sheet, which is brilliant. So how does it do it? Well, it takes that number and divides it by that number. So it's saying that another way of thinking about this, 83% of the time, this algorithm if you give it something positive, it will identify it as positive. That, that's what that's saying. Now that is plotted, that's called the true positive rate, and that is plotted on that y-axis there. So we've used that number and that number. The other, the distance in on this two-dimensional graph is the false positive rate divided by the actual negative rate, which is that point. So note that we have used, going back slide, those two numbers to put the point there, and those two numbers to put, sorry, those two numbers to put the point that far up, and those two numbers to put the point that far in. That point is defining all of those numbers. But wait, you say, Mark, you said this two-dimensional sheet encapsulated all the numbers in there, but you've only used four of them. But I also guarantee you're way ahead of me because these numbers are dependent on those. So if you have a true positive rate going up there of 83, that 17 is represented by that distance. Oh, look, there's even a slide to show it. And that number is represented there. So really and truly, that <clears throat> you can build a confusion matrix. It's got six numbers in it. Somebody worked out <clears throat> you can just put a single point on a piece of paper and summarize all of that. So the beauty of this is if you have a machine, machine a couple of well, three or four machine learning algorithms, each one of them can, can produce a single point in two-dimensional space, which is very neat. Okay. So rock space helps us to visualize the information in a confusion matrix. So where is the best possible place to be in rock space?
Well, this is the true positive rate. That's a good thing. That means you're getting things right. So the bigger the true positive rate, the better. The false positive rate <clears throat> is oddly enough how many of them you're getting wrong. Well, we want to be as low as possible on that scale. So we want to be as low as possible on that scale, and as high as possible on that scale. I think that's a really good place to be. And that is actually true. That is the best place to be <clears throat> in rock space. Good. Next question, where's the worst place to be? Well, it's fractionally more complicated because the obvious answer is down there. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? That's the right place to be. That's obviously the wrong place to be. But in practice, you never get down here. I've never ever seen anything even approach down here. And the reason for that is that rock space has this very elegant um, baseline there. And it is really difficult to get anything underneath that. I'm not saying it's impossible <clears throat> and you don't want to try to get anything under that, but you probably will never see anything under that. Excuse me a minute. Oh, you gotta love mute buttons. Okay, so why? Where does this line come from? Well, just think about this for a minute. We can investigate this. Suppose we had a really, 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 really dreadful machine learning algorithm. <clears throat> it's basically rubbish. It does nothing. In fact, <clears throat> when you give it, excuse me, when you give it a picture of a tractor, you can imagine it sitting there going, right, <clears throat> I've got a picture. Tractor. Oh, another picture. Tractor. Another picture, not a tractor. In other words, it's just guessing. Now that's really about as bad as you can get from machine learning algorithm. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not making any sensible decisions at all. Well, let's imagine that as a confusion matrix. <clears throat> and I'm imagining that we're feeding in 25 positives and 75 negatives. And what it's doing is just guessing. So these 25, it's getting half of them right and half of them wrong. These 75, it's getting half right and half wrong. Well, OK, we can do the calculation. We know how to do the calculation. So let's do it. That divided by that gives you the true positive rate. That divided by that gives you the false positive rate. And we are there in rock space. Because that's what you're going to get if you guess. Now here, I've changed the ratio of positive to negative. So I'll flip between those slides briefly. You can see I've weighted it here towards the negative, here towards the positive, and you'll notice it makes absolutely no difference. OK, the other thing I can change is its prediction. It might still be random, but it might favor positives or negatives. OK, let's do that. Oh, I'm just moving up and down this line. So one of the things that I find really elegant about rock curves or rock space is that as your algorithm gets bad, it leans towards this line, and that is the baseline. And you really won't see anything down here. <clears throat> so anything up here is better than average. May not be good, but it's better than average. What would happen if you did get something down there? Well, that would be an interesting case, <clears throat> because what it's saying is, as soon as you go below that line, if you show it a tractor, it is actually more likely to say not a tractor than tractor. It's actually getting more of them wrong. So imagine a case where you show it a tractor and nine times out of 10, it says not a tractor. Well, actually, if it, that's difficult to conceive, but if it was doing that, every time it said tractor, I would write down, well, that's not a tractor. And every time it said not a tractor, I'd write down, well, it, it thinks that's a tractor. And what we'd actually do is just reverse what everything it told us we'd believe the opposite, which would move it into the positive sphere. So I've never come across that, but it's a good indication of why you're not going to see anything underneath this line. It has to be worse than random. And if it was really worse than random, we just reverse the classification and it would be useful. So imagine that you build five different models. So you build five different neural nets. You can very easily test them, 
produce a confusion matrix, produce the two, two um, the true positive rate and the false positive rate, plot them, and you can very quickly see which ones are good and which ones are bad. And that's the beauty of rock space. Nominally, the best one is the one that's closest to that corner. Now, I'm going to put that argument on hold because that's not always the case, but that's a good starting point. And I was telling you <clears throat> that I had two students working on this tractor data, and one of them sent me his thesis this morning. And I was just preparing this talk. And I came across this diagram in it. This is perfect. So I stole it. I didn't. I asked his permission, of course. Um, so this shows you exactly that in operation. And this student was trying a whole lot of different approaches and techniques, and they all had different characteristics. And you can, this is wonderful. This is um, rock space absolutely in use. OK, and the next thing we need to talk about is what's called choosing a threshold. So I'm just reminding you, we're looking at tractors. This is a tractor. This isn't a tractor. This is still not a tractor. So we're testing the trained neural net with images it hasn't seen before. So we're at the same point I was discussing earlier. I'm just going to walk you through a different aspect of it. So we're feeding in new images into the neural net that it hasn't seen before. We know which ones are tractors and which aren't, but it doesn't. So it has to tell us its guess about this one. So we feed in a picture and it says tractor. How does it tell us it's a tractor? Well, the answer is there are various ways it can do it, but a fairly simple way is it outputs a numerical value between zero and one. And we have told it we want zero to be a tractor and one to be not a tractor. Again, that's arbitrary. I could have made that the other way around, but we'll make it that way. So you can imagine we're doing this process. It's going to output a number between zero and one. Anything down at zero is a tractor. Anything down at one is not a tractor. So with bated breath, we're about to feed it in. You can make your own judgment about whether this is a tractor or not. We squirt it into the neural net and it comes out with 0.93. And you think, well, shouldn't it have come out with one? Yeah, life's not like that. It's kind of come out with something close to one. Well, 0.93, we would classify that as not a tractor, and I'm putting it on that scale in approximately the right place by 0.93. <clears throat> OK, second one, feed in. I think that's a tractor. It thinks it's a tractor too. It puts down a point. Oh, that looks awfully like a people carrier to me, and the neural net agrees, and I get a point. And I could do 100 slides like this, but instead I'll short circuit that. I pushed through about 100 different pictures. There aren't 100 dots here. I was just throwing some dots down. And I've just piled them up as they begin to appear in the same place. And what you end up with is a distribution like that. So you'll end up with the distribution. In this case, the lowest figure I ever got was about 0.05. The highest one was about 0.35. But you can see a distribution here. And if we threw more and more data in, we would get a better and better distribution. Right, once we've got that, we choose a threshold. And the threshold says, essentially, anything below that we're going to call a tractor, and anything higher than that we're going to call not a tractor. And this is beautifully simple. What a nice distribution of data we've got. It's so easy to put this threshold down. There it goes in the middle. And in fact, I could move that down to 0.45 or 0.55, and it would still identify every single image perfectly. Brilliant. Excellent. And that all happened on the planet Zog, because on the planet Earth, you don't get nice, beautiful, separated distributions like this. Oh, you can do it with test data, but real data is messy because the photographs have got the sun in them, or there's a cloud, or there's a... Um, two cars passing at the same time. That is the idealized dream of machine learning that I've just given you. On Back on planet Earth, where photographs uh, get damaged, all sorts of things, that is not a bad approximation to reality. So what's happening is I throw tractors through. For most tractors, I'm getting a fairly low number. But there's a small number that have a surprisingly high value. 
The not tractors, they're mostly down here, but they overlap again. Now that's much more like reality. Okay, oh, we've got two distributions there, but they overlap. You can see the question that's coming. Where do we, <coughs> or the neural net, put the threshold? Because it has to have some number. It has to have some number that says below this it's a tractor, above that it's not a tractor. Well, okay, where are we going to put it? Because this is quite an important decision. And the neural net will often put one down where it thinks <coughs> it should go, but you can also bury it. Excuse me. Okay, now, aesthetically, where is a pleasing place to put it? Well, I think that looks good. You're kind of splitting that down. That's good. Yeah, but we're not doing this for aesthetics. We're doing this to actually make sensible decisions. So how are we going to know where we should put it? Well, let's think about the consequences. Wherever we put it, it has consequences. So here I pulled out just the tractors so we can see what's going on. If I put that um, deciding point there, if I put the threshold there, all of these guys are going to be classified as tractors, which is right because they are tractors. I've even put a tra picture of a tractor down here to remind you. So these guys are all going to be classified as tractors. These guys are tractors, but they're going to be misclassified as not tractors. Now we can fix that by moving that point all the way over here, uh, all the way, <clears throat> sorry, over there. But then it's going to mess up the non-tractors. So these are going to be correctly classified. These are going to be incorrectly classified if we put the threshold there. If we think about the tractors, sorry, the not tractors, most of them are correctly classified as not tractors. These two guys are going to get missed. Well, OK, does that help? Well, it does help because we can make use of what we know about confusion matrices and rock space to actually give us much more information about this. So suppose I put my threshold there. All of these guys, these are all not tractors. So this is the point at which I'm going to say anything on that side is a tractor, anything on that side is not a tractor. Good news. All of these not tractors are perfectly classified. And you can see that there. Those are the not tractors being fed in, and 100% of them are classified by the neural net as not tractor. Good job, neural, uh, good job, neural net. Unfortunately, about 5% of the tractors, which is about the area of that, are classified as tractors. This whole tranche back here are misclassified as not tractors. So that's a bit of a disaster. Not deterred by the disaster, we are going to calculate the TPR and the FPR. And as soon as we've done that, we think, I can plot that in rock space. And I can. There's that point. So if you split there, that is how well you are separating them. And the answer is, that's not very good. But now what I can do is walk this line backwards. And you are way ahead of me. I'm going to walk it right the way across that. There is my new point in rock space. There is a third point in rock space. And you're beginning to think, is this a rock curve? Well, it doesn't look very curved. So is it a rock curve? Walking across, we're doing the calculations each time. Oh, oh it's definitely got a curve there. And we walk it across, and that is what a rock curve is. So let me reiterate. If you build some kind of machine learning system, it will often output something like a value between 0 and 1. In a perfect world, every time it's a tractor, it will get exactly 0. Every time it's not a tractor, it will get exactly 1. Doesn't happen. You get a messy interface in there, or a messy overlap in the middle. The better your machine learning algorithm, the more those curves will separate, and the better this rock curve will look and be. But the rock curve is now giving you a lot of information about how this thing is working. Much more information than that single point we were dealing with earlier. The single point is useful enough. This rock curve <clears throat> is much more useful. And you'll notice that it doesn't have to be completely symmetrical. And I made this tail long 
and that's affecting this curve. So these guys, these rock curves, this is where we've got to. We've gone from machine learning algorithms can get it right in two ways and get it wrong in two ways. We can formalize that as a confusion matrix. Once you have the confusion matrix, you can calculate these two values, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Once you have those and you take the output from your machine learning algorithm, you can walk across it and see how effective it would be to put your threshold in different places. And this is a very, very good description of what that machine learning algorithm is doing. So rock curves are very important estimators of the efficiency of machine learning algorithms and other things, incidentally. <clears throat> I'm talking uh, to you guys tonight about them in the context of machine learning and data science. Um, they are used in lots of other places and they are equally efficient there, but I'm focusing on a particular niche use. It's also worth stressing to you. Now, I think rock curves are brilliant. I love rock curves. But I think it's very important to know their strengths and their weaknesses and what they do and they do not measure. And one of the interesting things about this rock curve, when you think about where it came from and what it's showing you, is this. That if you remember, at one point, I had my threshold on 0 0.4. And I was saying, well, OK, everything on this side's a track where everything isn't. That led to that point there going on the rock curve. But you'll notice that that 0 0.4 doesn't feature in this rock space at all. So once you've drawn the curve, it's not telling you where you put the threshold anymore. That information is lost. Now, it's still somewhere in your workings and it's in your table and you can go back and find it. But do not ever be misled. This this thing keeps on disappearing. This scale down here is the one we use to place that threshold. That is the one value down there that never appears in rock space. That's not a major disadvantage. Just don't go looking for it on the diagram. <clears throat> Next question is, does the rock curve tell us where to put the threshold? Does it say this is the best place to put the threshold? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. It's a, it gives you a lot of information. It's a great help in making that decision. But no, it doesn't actually tell you. Now, from what I said to you earlier, up here is the best place to be. OK, so why isn't that the best place to be? Well, remember what these two things are measuring. This distance, if we consider that point, say, that one there. This distance up here is a measure of how many true positives you have. This distance from there to there is the number of false negatives you've got. Similarly down here, if we're talking about that point there, that distance is a measure of the false positives. That distance is a measure of the true negatives. So we have all four values in that diagram. Well, OK, the reason we don't just automatically choose that guy is that the cost of these four things, false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives, the costs of all those can be very different to your business, to your people. So you may trade off a lower figure in one to get a higher figure in one, because either the higher figure brings you more money or the lower one kills fewer people. So we, this rock curve is really, really useful information, but it's not a decider about anything. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose you're di diagnosing a disease. You can test somebody for the disease and a false positive would say, OK, we're testing uh, this person. The test comes back and says that you have the disease. I'm sorry about that. Because the disease is serious, we always test people a second time. We're going to test you again. Oh, you haven't got it. That's lucky. Maybe we'll do a third test. No, you still haven't got it. OK, you're fine. 
In other words, a false positive, which I've just described to you, we said the person had the disease, but we were wrong. That might cost us five pounds to retest. A false negative may kill the patient. They come in, we test them. They do actually have the disease, although we don't know that. The test comes back negative, you're fine. Off you go. A false negative may kill the patient. So where are you going to set the threshold for that? Clearly, I have no answer to that question. That isn't an academic question, but it's something we have to balance when we are choosing where to put this threshold, because we can influence the ratio of true positive to false positive. We can, we can influence that. So that is a very important thing. And incidentally, I am aware that um, a false positive can be very bad for the patient because you may test them, you may think they have the disease, you may subject them to radiotherapy, and then it turns out they didn't have the disease. I'm not making any comment about how we test people here. I'm saying the costs of these can be very different. <clears throat> and there's a very interesting sideline we're not going to go into, but just in case you want sort of some more information about that. There's a very interesting process called the expected payoff, which is very well documented. It's been around since about the 1730s. It's pretty well understood. And that can be applied to this idea of helping to tell us where we put the threshold. I decided that was simply a digression too far in a lecture that should only last 40, talk that should only last 45 minutes. But that's an interesting application you can apply to that. Maybe that would make another talk, but Expected payoffs are really interesting kind of mathematical thing we can do. I reckon I've got three minutes, Mark. What do you reckon? Yeah. Yes, and then we'll do some Q&A. OK, right. So I have a slide that says, thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. But I also have some slides I can probably fit in three minutes, which are what is, where does the rock curve come from? So they have their origins in signal detection theory which is about distinguishing the noise from the not noise. In other words, finding the signal. Um, equally confusingly, the rock is actually a mythical bird and the rock was huge. Um, this illustration to me does not cut it at all. Let me give you another illustration. Uh, that gives you some idea of how big the rock was. Happily, they're extinct now. Um, so suppose you wanted so suppose you're um, an ancient Greek and you want to tell if rocks are coming because they're going to carry your elephants away. You need to know about this. You would probably have invented radar. So here is radar. We're trying to detect that rock. If you watch any radar in a film, it's always beautifully clear and it's got a line that goes round and things go bleep and you get little dots everywhere. It's brilliant. There is the rock in reality. Here is the radar reflection from rock, nice little white spot. <clears throat> and if we think of that about in terms of light intensity, that part of the screen is completely dark, dark. This part of the screen is completely white. If you want to decide, have you spotted a rock or not? Well, you can put a threshold in and say, anything lower than this is not a rock. Anything higher than that is a blip, is a rock. Well, if radar looks like that, it's fairly easy to see where the blips are. In the early days of radar, it wasn't like that at all. And it didn't even consist of a screen like that. It had blips on screens. It was really complicated to read. It was much, much less clear. <clears throat> and the guys who were working on this, and this is early work, I think, during the Second World War or slightly before the Second World War, they had screens like this where... Where something wasn't was just a mess, and where something might have been was a bit of a mess as well. They were trying to separate out at what point should they sound the alarm and say there are bombers coming. Does anything look familiar on this diagram? It's exactly the same problem that we face. So it was those guys back in the 1940s, maybe the 1930s, who were interested in separating the signal from the noise, there is just background noise. There is the signal. They faced exactly the same problem. Where do you put the threshold? And they did all the fundamental work on receiver operator characteristics. 
the characteristics of operators who are running receivers that are receiving information. Which I th find wonderful that this work owes so much to work from well, whatever it is, 80, 70, 80 years ago. That's where rock curves come from. And they were, they were plotting rock curves. After those extra sides, you have been a wonderful and a very patient audience. I thank you.